Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, my name is Paula Berge. I'm a technical evangelist with Microsoft Canada. Uh, it's kind of an interesting title. Uh, some of you may already know me, some of you don't. Uh, if you don't know me, this is uh, a good virtual introduction. Uh, my role at Microsoft Canada is to work with developers such as yourselves to really understand our platform, whether that's Windows Phone, Windows 8, um, HTML5, Azure, uh, you name it. All those types of things uh, we our, our group in general is actually responsible for. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact myself or any of my colleagues if you happen to know them, but there's my contact information right there. So um, my role at Microsoft is I'm really f very focused on Windows Phone 8 in a lot of ways, um, trying to get developers to build applications and games on the platform. So really that's what today is all about. We're going to talk about Windows Phone 8 development, uh, both from a native standpoint as well as from a hybrid standpoint. And what I mean by hybrid is talking about uh, phone development using HTML5 techniques. We're not going to talk about that specifically in this session. That's in the third session of the day. Uh, but uh, we are going to talk about some of the things, the features that light up Windows Phone 8 and uh, some of the things that you might be considering to do within your Windows Phone 8 applications. And also talk, to, talk a little bit about the platform itself and why it's important. So without further ado, let's start it. Let's start it right here. So. Windows Phone 8 is a modern smartphone platform, a smartphone platform, as you can see right here. There's a whole bunch of things that uh, Windows Phone 8 really brings, uh, but frankly, there's, there's a lot of history there as well. So Windows Mobile was a predecessor of Windows Phone, as uh, some of you may already know. Uh, we actually brought that out in the early 2000s, either 2000 or 2001. And it was great at the time, but we really didn't sort of revise it and evolve it in the appropriate way. And then the whole mobile game changed with, uh, let's call it a spade a spade, and it was the iPhone that came out. Fantastic product. And then we have great uh, competitors such as Android. Blackberry's out with their new uh, platform as well. We realized that we had to do something that was, uh, that was new, fresh, but also something that was not being different for different sake. We wanted something that actually made your life easier, uh, more productive, happier, those types of things. And that's what Windows Phone 7, which we launched around two, two and a half years ago now, uh, was all about. It was trying to provide that great new experience for mobile uh, mobile experiences. And we've revised this and we've evolved it once again with Windows Phone 8. And in fact, this is a, as much of a leap uh, from Windows Phone 7 to Windows Phone 8 as Windows Mobile was to Windows Phone 7. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily see that because it looks very similar to what Windows Phone 7 is, but we've completely changed the architecture of our platform. And with that uh, comes a, a number of great opportunities for you to actually build amazing experiences that frankly you could not do on Windows Phone or Windows Mobile in the past. And it really does sort of reflect our three screens in this cloud strategy. So the television, the phone, and the desktop or laptop or PC in general, all these things are starting to show up as being you know, a consistent experience across. And it's all glued together uh, through cloud-based um, uh, services such as uh, the Windows Azure services that we have uh, today. So that's really where we're at. And uh, this was just a, a monumental shift in how we actually take a look at things. And I, it's really kind of interesting because uh, the market, even though we do have small market share, it's, that's obviously a fact, uh, we are seeing the fact that uh, we are gaining in market share in ways that we've never seen before for our phone product. Uh, so Steve Ballmer, our CEO, actually came on to uh, uh, one of the major mobile sort of uh, conferences and said that year over year growth for Windows Phone has actually been four times. So that's like a quadruple growth year over year uh, that we're seeing, which means that we're in the going in the right direction and we have that inertia and that momentum going. And it's right now is a good time for you guys to start taking a look at the platform and adopting it for your uh, applications and games. So there's a kind of interesting thing that we're seeing here. And uh, I talked a little bit about this shared heritage between Windows Phone 7, Windows Phone 8, and even Windows 8. This whole idea of a three screens in the cloud sort of idea. And there is a lot of misconceptions as to what Windows Phone 8 is compared to what Windows 8 is. A lot of people equate the two, and that's not entirely true, even though there's a whole lot that is very, very similar across the board as well. And this slide here, we're just going to have a quick uh, sort of um, animation set that sort of describes exactly what's similar across these things. So on the left hand side you see the original Windows Phone 7 and in the middle we have Windows Phone 8 and then you have Windows 8 on the right hand side. Now 
let's take a look at what happened with um, uh, Windows Phone 7. So as I said before, Windows Phone 7's heritage came from Windows Mobile. And Windows Mobile, uh, the operating system that was built on that was basically Windows CE, which stood for Windows Compact Edition. It was built for PDAs originally, and then we actually brought it out for phones. And that was good uh, for the time being, but it, we didn't evolve it, as I said before, and it was very, very tough for us to actually compete with the new modern smartphone platforms that were coming out. And in order to get ourselves out there, we actually decided to take Windows CE uh, and actually put a shell on it. And that was what Windows Phone 7 was. And that's kind of interesting because a lot of people don't actually realize that. So the ability to create C Sharp uh, and XAML games uh, in apps, in XNA games and everything else like that, Silverlight sort of technologies, if you will, um, these things were basically a shell that was built on top of Windows Mobile Compact Edition, which is kind of interesting uh, because it looks nothing like Mobile 6.5 and below. So that's good, but it sort of was um, the halfway there type of thing. We had a lot of work to do, but this was a good start on the experiential side. It actually brought us into a whole new world using the modern UI uh, and gained us some great uh, traction, actually, if you think about it, with, uh, with critics around what a mobile experience should be. What you do have with Windows 8 and Win uh, Windows Phone 8 is you have a little bit of shared heritage between these two. So if you take a look, so just you have the Windows kernel. So Windows 8 is actually, its heritage is Windows NT. Uh, even though that's been around for a long time, it has evolved over time. Very, very popular and very, very robust, secure, all those types of things, performance. These are the sort of the, the forefathers of what Windows 8 was. And the Windows kernel sort of reflects that. There's a lot of shared, uh, or there's a lot of goodness around the networking stack, the driver models, the file system, and all those types of things. We've actually brought that to Windows Phone 8. So Windows Phone 8 is actually the NT kernel as well. So there is a shared kernel between the two of them, and that's kind of interesting. We'll get to that in the next few slides because there's some interesting things associated with that. So what does it mean? Uh, when we talk about a shared core with Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8, we're saying that you know that the kernel components are, are the same across those two operating systems or platforms, if you will. Uh, networking, graphics, file system, all those things that you see right there, they're all the same. And in, addi in addition to that, you actually have a situation where uh, the driver models are actually similar as well. And this is really important because it allows uh, hardware manufacturers to really sort of standardize on their drivers so that they actually work well across. So if you think about things like a, a Bluetooth headset, for example, uh, you can use a Bluetooth headset with Windows 8 as you would with any other sort of uh, Windows platform. But you can actually use that same driver model. Uh, the driver model associated with Windows 8 is on Windows Phone, which means that that Bluetooth headset may be able to be used with Windows Phone as well, without further changes from the OEM manufacturer to do that. So there's sort of economies of scale that you get from doing those type of standardization things. What it doesn't mean, however, is that Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8 apps can run on each other. And that actually is an interesting conversation that I've had with developers. And the whole idea behind that is, you know, you take a look at iOS, you have the iPad and you have the iPhone, for example, even Android for that matter. Um, it's the same operating system for tablet OSs as well as the phone OS. Um, the form factor is obviously very, very different, but we've actually taken a different tact. So it would have been technically you know, quote unquote, easy to run Windows Phone applications in Windows 8, but that doesn't bring the right experience out. What we feel is that you have to cater the experience to the right form factor. So a phone application doesn't really fit well on a tablet because of the fact that a phone application has a very tight form factor and has very specific sort of functionality and features that are specific to a smartphone. While as a PC or a tablet has a whole bunch of other things that are very, very different that allow people to do different things other than what you would have on a smartphone. And as a result, we feel that in order to get the right experience across Windows and then Windows Phone is to actually separate those two applications. So that's kind of the thoughts behind why we've actually not decided to allow Windows Phone applications to run on Windows 8. It does, however, mean that you can actually share code between the two. And we'll get a little bit into that right now. So, with the introduction of Windows Phone 8, uh, we've actually added a new platform to, uh, for developers to make use of, and that's called the Windows Phone Runtime, WinPRT for short. And if you're familiar with Windows 8 programming, 
uh, WinPRT should be somewhat familiar to you in the fact that it's very, very similar in naming, at least, to WinRT, not Windows RT, but WinRT. WinRT stands for the Windows Runtime, which is basically the platform or the runtime uh, framework for building applications, modern UI applications on Windows 8. So there is a shared heritage there between the two uh, platforms as well, between Phone 8 and Windows 8. If you take a look at the uh, graphic here, you have in WinRT around 11,000, give or take, uh, API members, which is a significant number. Basically, what we done, we've done with Windows Phone 8 is we've actually had a number of those uh, platform APIs are actually very, very similar, if not the exact same thing as WinRT. So WinPRT, there's around 2,800 members that are basically the same API calls as you would have on WinRT. But in addition to that, there's a number of new API sets within WinPRT that have nothing to do with Windows 8. And a lot of those things have to do with things such as VoIP, as you can see right here, speech synthesis and lock screen and lock screen manager, all those types of things that actually have uh, you know, valid context on the phone, but may not necessarily have the right context on, on Windows or a PC type operating system. So what we've tried to do here, or the engineering teams tried to do, is provide a, an easy way for you to share as much code as possible between Windows 8 and Windows Phone, uh, but at the same time, catering appropriately to the right platforms, right? So context is really important when you're talking about mobile experiences, whether that's smartphone or tablet, or in our parlance, we basically call a tablet a PC. So, that's all well and good, but you know, if you're new to Windows Phone development, you may have a few questions on how you actually get started. Uh, and that's a valid question, certainly. Um, it's one of those things that you know, sometimes it's very, very difficult to get started because there's actually so much information out there. So the first thing you need to do is basically understand and, and commit to memory this URL that you see right here. So it's basically dev.windowsphone.com. This is the Windows Phone App Center sort of area. Um, the, the developer center, I should say. Anything and everything you ever wanted to do with Windows Phone, you will basically get from here, uh, literally. So as you can see, you get the SDK for free. Uh, it includes a, a version of Visual Studio Express that allows you to build applications, and you don't have to pay a cent for it. Um, you can also get articles and you know get samples, all those types of things. Uh, and actually, the sample set for Windows Phone is actually very, very good right now. We have around 600 examples or sample code that you can take a look at to figure out exactly how you do certain things. But in addition to that, that code is actually royalty free, which means that you can take that code and use it however you need to within your application. So you can feel free to pilfer whatever it is that you need. In addition to that, uh, you have the ability to submit applications from the developer center as well. So the model, if you're not familiar with what Windows Phone does, it's actually very similar to um, to the iPhone model, uh, as well as to an extent, I guess you could say Google Play uh, from a store perspective. Every single application or game that you get on Windows Phone, with a few exceptions, uh, you get actually through the Windows Phone store. Uh, the reason for that is we can control quality and uh, content, both from a content as well as from a technical standpoint. We want to make sure that there's no malicious code in your applications. Not that you would do that, but some people might. Uh, the whole point is to have a great experience for users and users when they actually download an application or game. So we set the minimum quality bar for you to actually hit before we actually certify your app and allow it in the, in the uh, store itself. As I said, there's a few, uh, um, uh, few, few areas where this is not the case, where you don't have to go through the store. An example of this is if you have a developer account, you can developer unlock your Windows phone so that you can sideload an application for testing purposes on hardware. So you can do that on up to three phones per developer account. Um, in addition to that, uh, for enterprise uh, customers, there's a number of things where you know an enterprise customer or a business customer in general may have a line of business application that they don't want available on the store. Um, you can absolutely sideload applications that way using some of our software such as System Center or Windows Intune, but that's sort of outside of the scope of what we're going to be talking about here today. Um, so what do you need to actually run it? So say, for example, you have you know, the Developer Center on your browser and, and you need to uh, uh, download the, the SDK, here's some of the things that you're going to need to know. So you'll need a 64-bit version of Windows 8. So you can't build Windows Phone 8 uh, apps on Windows uh, 7, for example. 
Um, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, and you also need the 64-bit versus, versus the 32-bit. And the reason for that is uh, the 64-bit uh, version is required for Hyper-V. And if you take a look down to the third area, the Windows Phone emulator, you need Windows 8 Pro or higher for Hyper-V. And Hyper-V is our uh, virtualization technology that allows us to create virtual machines. And in fact, the whole emulator is in fact a virtual machine in and of itself. Um, and it does require you to have second level address translation on the motherboard, SLAT for short. So if you're buying a new PC uh, and you intend to do use it for uh, Windows Phone development going forward, make sure it has SLAT uh, and you're using Windows 8 Pro. Now the reason why you need 64-bit for this uh, whole thing is the fact that Hyper-V does require 64-bit uh, version as well. So that's kind of what we're doing here. The emulator uh, to do your testing in a virtual sense requires 64-bit hardware so uh, and uh, an operating system. So as I said before, if you actually want to develop and publish applications and games for Windows Phone 8, you'll need a developer account. And it's $99 Canadian a year. Um, and uh, you need to pay that every year. But there's a whole bunch of things you get for that. Um, and I'll get to the first bullet point in a second. But basically, um, you, you get it. Uh, with that, you have the ability to publish applications, but you also have the ability to monitor your application's health, whether that's you know how many downloads you're getting per day, or you know what types of crashes are your users experiencing, and things like that. There's a whole bunch of analytics that are associated with it as well. Now, if you happen to be a student and uh, you are a member of the DreamSpark program, um, which is available for post-secondary institutions across the world. Um, you're, if you're a student in uh, college or university, you may be eligible for this. You actually get a free account out of the box, so you don't have to even worry about that. So uh, just be aware of that. Also, if you have a, a BizSpark account, which is for startups. So if you're a startup and you're looking to get into uh, Windows Phone development, uh, you do get a free uh, membership as well, annual membership as part of your MSDM subscription. or if you have an MSDN subscription through other means, whether you're an enterprise customer and you have a volume uh, agreement, uh, definitely take a look at that because you do have access to a free membership in of itself as well. And if you have any questions around getting an MSDN subscription, uh, talk to your local Visual Studio rep, give me a shout, I'd be happy to get you in touch with the right people there. That said, to actually start building your applications, you don't need a, a, a phone developer account right away. You can download the SDK, start coding, start testing on the emulator and everything else like that. Uh, you only need it if you want to start testing your application on hardware, so you sideload it to a developer unlocked device, or you uh, need to publish your application. So um, just keep that in mind. You don't need to start right away with, uh, uh, with a, phone app, uh, a phone developer account if you don't want to. So let's talk about the application model. So now that we got that out of the way, let's talk about how you actually build for Windows Phone 8. So there's three main ways that you actually do this. So there's a .NET API, there's a Windows Phone runtime in Win32, which is basically native uh, support. There's actually a third one for, or a fourth one, I should say, for HTML, but we're going to deal with that in the third session today. So stay tuned for that. So the first one, if you take a look at it, the .NET API, I'm not going to get too detailed into each of these three until the next few slides, but there's various different ways you can do this. So Windows Phone 7 development was done using the .NET API, so the Silverlight way of doing things. So that's C Sharp or VB using XAML. And XAML is a uh, XML-based markup language uh, standing, that stands for Extensible Application Markup Language. And uh, th those sort of ways of actually building applications is still absolutely valid going forward. Likewise, uh, you could build in XNA, which is basically our game framework. It allows you to sort of build games using a managed code environment uh, with C Sharp or VB.NET. Um, that is still definitely a way going forward for, uh, for building games in Windows Phone 8. One note, though, is that we have officially deprecated XNA moving forward. So it is feature complete. Uh, we do, do support it uh, in Windows Phone 8. But uh, moving forward, uh, you may want to think about other ways to actually build your game. So whether that's through HTML or using C++ managed code or even just building your own APIs or using your own APIs for game, uh, gaming frameworks on the managed code stack, such as Mono XNA or something like that. For Windows Phone 8, uh, you have that same idea as well. So you have the ability to use C Sharp and VB.NET with XAML. And the good thing is, is you have 
access to both the .NET APIs for Windows Phone as well as the Windows Phone runtime. So if you're moving towards Windows Phone 8 and you want to build in C Sharp and XAML, you get both of those for free, uh, if you want to call it that, which is kind of good. And then you can also build uh, games, for example, using C Sharp, VB, and XAML in Direct3D. So Direct3D is a technology that allows you to build three-dimensional graphics and things like that. Um, it gets complicated. I have an example to show you in a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the code, obviously, because if you've done Direct 3D graphics before, it gets heavy, heavy, heavy. Uh, but you can at least see what it kind of looks like. And then finally, uh, if you want to do things within C++, that is now a model that you can make use of today as well, uh, using unmanaged code, so code that actually compiles directly to the platform without a managed layer for that to interprets that code for you, using DirectX and Direct 3D. So that's using C++. So as I said before, if you're building a traditional Windows Phone application, the way you used to do it on Windows Phone 7.x, um, you can absolutely still do that today in Windows Phone 8. And the good news is, is if that's what you used to do going forward, that skill set is still absolutely usable going forward as well, which is good. Um, there's not a whole lot of difference in how you actually build your applications. You may have to learn some of the Windows Phone runtime API sets, but frankly, a lot of what you know is already there and you can actually make use of it. And in fact, what we'll do is we'll actually show you a very, very quick example of how to build a very simple managed code application uh, in, uh, in XAML and C Sharp, for example. So I'm just going to exit this and I'm going to go to Visual Studio, which I have already up right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go to File, New, Project. And as you can see here, I'm in the Windows Phone section. So if you have Visual Studio Express 2012 for Windows Phone 8, you'll only see the Windows Phone uh, object or op option for Visual C Sharp or Visual Basic. I'm using Visual Studio Ultimate, which provides you with a whole lot of goodness associated with testing uh, your applications and things like that. Our paid SKUs have more features and functionalities for, uh, for building applications on Windows Phone as well as other applications. But at least to get started on Visual Studio Express, anything that I'm going to show you here will work just fine. But as you move forward, you may want to consider to actually move into a paid SKU because it does provide a lot of goodness. So as you can see here, there's a whole number of different templates. So there's a Windows Phone app, which is basically a basic uh, blank app. You have a data bound app, which is basically a list based app. And list based apps are very popular on phones for various for different reasons. You see it on iOS, you see it on Android, and of course, obviously on Windows Phone as well. You can also create class libraries that you can share across different sort of uh, phone projects if you want, and a number of other ones, which I'm not going to really talk about today, uh, or at least right now. I will talk a little bit in the third session about the HTML5 uh, template, which we'll deal with a bit later. So, so we'll just leave it at that. I'm just going to call this Windows Phone App uh, 11. That's fine. Just leave it to that uh, directory. And the first thing that pops up is this question. Do you want to target Windows Phone 8 or do you want to target Windows Phone 7.1? Now, 7.1 is basically the Mango release. At least it used to be called the Mango release for Windows Phone 7. And from a marketing standpoint, Windows Phone 7.1 is equivalent to Windows Phone 7.5. They're actually the same thing. Windows Phone 7.1 is the engineering term. Windows Phone 7.5 is the, uh, the marketing term. So if you're building for Windows Phone 7 and you, don't care, and, and you want to make sure that you have applications that Windows Phone 7 uh, users can make use of, you pick Windows Phone 7.1. Uh, if you have a Windows Phone 8 uh, project, unfortunately, Windows Phone 7 uh, users will not be able to use this application because it uses the, the new Windows Phone runtime. Uh, but moving forward, this is less and less of an issue because we see a lot of people recycling their phones to Windows Phone 8 uh, uh, from Windows Phone 7. Uh, but if you do require backward support, you might want to consider using the 7.1 uh, solution instead. So I'm just going to click OK. We'll get this going through. Okay. So I'm just going to make this a little smaller. As you can see here, there's a visual example of what the page looks like. Uh, this is just a one-page app right now. And this XML that you see right here is literally just XAML. It's, it basically defines your UI, which is kind of cool because basically your UI is defined within markup, which makes it easy to sort of you know, get text blocks or input types and things like that if you want to. But likewise, the code behind, if you're familiar with it, 
is right here. And you can see there's a main page.xaml.cs, which is a code behind C sharp file that manages the functionality behind that XAML code. And you can use uh, screen assets like text blocks or input boxes or buttons that are defined on the XAML with the code and vice versa. So, so there's a lot of uh, flexibility there. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you Blend, which is our interactive design tool that comes with the SDK when you download it. And the reason why I'm going to do that is I'm going to open with Blend. So I right-clicked on main page.xaml. And it's opening it up in Blend because I'm going to use this to sort of uh, set up my layout a little bit. So I'm just going to exit that. Don't need that. Just wait for this to show up. All right. So what I can do here is I'm going to click on this. Going to make a button. Very very simple. Going to rename this button to say for example my button. Oop, spelt it. And I'm going to add a text box right here, or text block, I should say. And I'll call this my text. And that's basically all I need to do right now. So if you take a look, I'm going to save this. Now, this is a visual thing. Now, I can do a whole bunch of things like animations, but we don't have a lot of time to talk about that. So I'm not going to get too, too much into that. But if you take a look here, I'm going to click on this. So I've selected the button, and I'm actually going to go to this uh, uh, lightning bolt, which basically is our event handler uh, list right here. So just click on that. And as you see, there's a whole bunch of different types of events that I can hook up to this button. So I can say key down. I can say mouse enter. But in this case, click, which is a similar to a tap in this case. So I'm just going to say uh, button clicked. Just going to call it that. And when I leave focus, it's actually going to hook up an event that will fire whenever this button is tapped. And as you can see here, there's some C-sharp code that's associated with it. So I'm not going to actually deal with that here. I just wanted to show you that you can do stuff in Blend. But I'm going to save this. And I'm going to go to Visual Studio again. And it's going to show me a, a box that shows up that says something's changed. Because basically what I've done is that the Visual Studio example that I showed you right there, um, uh, or not the visual, the example, but basically the code has changed because I'm using the same solution structure and project that I did within Visual Studio as within Blend. So that's uh, something I want to update. And if you take a look down here now, we have button clicked. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say my text dot text equals. Oop, that's not what I wanted. How's it going? It's a little bit of a variant on Hello World. So as you can probably imagine, all this button is going to do is it's going to change the text in that text block. Now, one of the things I want to show you is that we have an emulator. So you can actually take a look here, and you can actually change this into a uh, the, the target to a device, which means that if you want to hardware tar uh, test this application on hardware, as long as the device is developer unlocked, you can do that. And then you have a number of different sort of um, uh, profiles here that you can make use of. So for example, we have emulator WVGA 512 megabytes of, uh, of uh, memory. So I'm just going to click on that. And it's just going to connect to it. Oh, shoot. OK, hold on a second here. Let's exit this. I was on a different profile. So let's just, for the sake of being quick, Wait for this to just get back. It's fine. I'm going to change this to WVGA so I can make use of the emulator that I already had up. There we go. And as you see here, there's a text block. If I click the button, how's it going? Very, very simple. Nothing too wild there. Okay. So I'm going to stop debugging because we don't need that anymore. And I'm going to exit that and get back to the demo, or to the slides. So XNA, uh, you can actually do XNA gaming uh, using managed code as well. Um, it's, uh, as I said before, it's deprecated, which means that you know moving forward, you may not want to use XNA for actually building games. You may want to just go straight HTML5, use your own framework and managed code for C-sharp, such as Mono XNA or Mono Game. 
uh, or you can actually go C++ with Direct3D or whatever it is that you want. There's lots of options there for you that you can make use of. But if you are familiar with XNA and you want to continue down that route to actually build applications and games that way, you certainly can do that. Direct3D is interesting. So if you ever wanted to build Halo on your Windows Phone device, uh, this would be kind of the way to do it. Um, you build it using native code, uh, and it, uh, in other words, C or C++, and uh, it allows you a lot of power. So you get right down to the middle of the actual uh, platform so that you can actually build all sorts of interesting things. So I'm just going to show you very, very quickly what this looks like because I think this is worthwhile taking a good look at. This is Marble Maze, and if I take a look at this very, very quickly, this is all C++. As you can see here, there's a C++ file. There's a lot of header files and, and code and things like that. This is a fairly simple game, but if you take a look, for example, I can just show you very quickly some of the code. It's just C++. I'm not going to go through the code itself because um, we don't, don't have enough time to do that. But if you're familiar with C++ or if you want to build a game that's very, very deep in, um, um, in, in, in richness and three-dimensional views, you can absolutely do that. So I'm actually going to run this in the emulator. And yeah, just rebuild them. It's going to deploy it to the actual device. Okay, I'll bring this over here. That's fine. Continue. So here's the splash screen. Here's to start the game. So if I start the game, actually, before I do that, I'm going to go right here. And I'm going to use the accelerometer. So the, the, the uh, emulator has the ability to use an accelerometer within the game as well, within your application. So if you don't have a, a hardware device and you want to test accelerometer capability, you have the ability to do that. To do that excuse me. Uh, you also have the ability to have location and things like that associated with it if you wanted to. So I'm going to start the game, and you see two, one. It's a three-dimensional game, so I can, you know, go over here. Just bring this around. There we go. So it's doing all sorts of things here. So it seems to be stuck, but you sort of get the idea, right? It's one of those sort of maze games and, and things like that. Three-dimensional, it's the marble has textures and things like that. So if you if this was something that you wanted to really, really have a rich sort of environment, like if you were trying to build Halo on, on Windows Phone, this would be the way to go. So that's just an example right there. So I'll just exit that. And we'll stop debugging. Okay. All right. So you can actually use Direct3D and XAML together as well if that's something that you wanted to do. Um, I'm not going to get too much into this, but if you're familiar with Direct3D gaming, uh, in order to create menus, for example, you had to do that sprite by sprite, which is very, very painful to do. XAML's really good at you know, providing menuing structures and things like that because it's very flexible in that way. So you don't have to worry about building things in sprite format if that's something you didn't want to. You can actually mix and match the two, and that's basically what this is all about. And again, I'm not going to get too, too much into this, but if, say, for example, you wanted to use a uh, library with managed code as well as native code. So for example, say you were creating a voice over IP client such as Skype. Uh, you might have native code libraries that actually do the, sweat, the socket support and things like that. That's where you would actually make use of that. And then the UI, you could actually build in XAML and managed code that contacts and makes use of those different libraries if that's something you wanted to do. And then finally, um, just in general, COM and, and Win32. So these are the good old days of Windows 95, Windows 3.1 even to an extent. If you're familiar with COM or COM Plus, Component Object Model, it's still alive and well and has been all the way through. It's just been sort of uh, abstracted from you unless you've actually needed it. The great thing about COM is that it actually is a bit of a plug and play model that allows you to take software components that you can make use of in various different software projects in a loosely coupled manner so that you can actually uh, get resources and remove resources uh, from memory and things like that in an interesting way. So if you're familiar with COM and you like it, this is a good way to go. If you're not familiar with COM but if you need to get down to the metal, you may want to pick up a, a copy of Don Box's uh, bo a book called Essential COM, which is the, basically the Bible for COM. Um, it's not an easy read, but once you get it, it's actually pretty cool. So just think about that. And then finally, HTML5 development. And I'm going to really skip over this very, very quickly because of the fact that we have a full session on this in the third session of the day. So just, uh, just a little bit of a, a tip or a, a little bit of a treat coming up. So uh, keep in mind for that. 
So here are some of the features that light up Windows Phone 8. Uh, and so now that we've gone through the models, how you actually build applications for Windows Phone, here's some of the things that you might want to consider implementing the features that you might want to implement in your apps and games. So the first thing is we've got three screen resolutions, which is different than what we've had ever before. So the WVGA, which is basically 800 by 480, a 15 by 9 uh, sort of aspect ratio, this is the traditional Windows Phone 7 uh, aspect ratio. So if you're familiar with Windows Phone 7 development, this was a good old 800 by 480 that you always knew and, and used and everything else like that. We also have WXGA, which is 1280 by 768. And so this is a higher screen resolution and allows for, for better sort of picture quality and everything else like that. But you'll notice that the aspect ratio is also 15 by 9, which means that you don't have to do anything at all within your application to have that sort of screen uh, stretching and it'll work just fine. So you don't have to worry about that. Now we do have a third version of the screen resolution at 720p, which is 1280 by 720 which as you can imagine is slightly different than what you have in an aspect ratio compared to WXGA. So this is a high definition um, screen resolution. Now, you may need to do a few things to make sure that your application scales properly in this case because of the fact that um, it, the, screen, the aspect ratio is slightly different, there is a stretching there. If you don't do anything with your application, what you'll end up with is maybe a black bar on the top or bottom or maybe only one of the two. So if you're okay with that, and that's part of the experience that you're okay with, then all, by all means, you don't have to do anything to support that, uh, that, that uh, resolution within your application. Uh, but if you do want to make sure that it looks a little bit more professional, add some code in that does detection on the screen so you can lay out the, uh, the screen appropriately for your application if it's a 720p device. Tiles are really important. Now, this is nothing new to anybody that knows Windows Phone 7 or Windows 8 for that matter. Uh, but what we've done is for third-party developers, we've added the support for you to actually create a tile for your application that is double wide, so the rectangle that you can see on the right-hand side, or the mini tile. I call them quarter-sized tiles because they're kind of quarter-sized, uh, but those are the really small ones. And the reason why this is important is because live tiles represent a way that you can make your application visually pop. And we'll talk about ways that you can actually make your application pop really, really visually in the last session of today when we talk about marketplace tips. Uh, but the whole idea behind this is to create a really immersive experience, even on the start screen. And if you really want to create that connection, the emotional connection with the user, you might want to create something where you actually have a great experience on the tile, on both the double wide, regular size, which is a square one, and then the quarter size tile, as I call them. Um, really important to actually think about how you're providing that information to the user where it's appropriate. So think about that. Ooh. Okay, yeah. The other thing, which is similar to live tiles in the way that you can actually push in information to uh, the phone, is a lock screen. So everybody is probably familiar with a lock screen. We you know when you power up your phone or power it up from sleep mode or whatever it is that you're doing, you see the lock screen. Typically in the past and on other phones, this is basically a picture you, you've decided to put on your phone. And that's all well and good. But say, for example, you wanted to add more information and more dynamic uh, content to your application, you can absolutely do that. So a great example of this is there's an application called Weatherflow. On, uh, it was on Windows Phone 7. They've upgraded it for Windows Phone 8 as well. They've added lock screen capabilities so that it actually takes a look at the GPS uh, or any sort of location data that it has, finds out where you are, and it actually pushes information on the weather, you know, chance of precipitation, the, the, the temperature, whether or not you need an umbrella, all those types of things. It pushes it to the lock screen so that when you turn on the screen to your phone, it shows this on the lock screen. So that's a very immersive experience even on the lock screen for your application. So you may want to consider using that because it's actually something that shows a lot of value. Now I'm going to show you very, very quickly how an, a lock screen can actually be implemented. So I'm actually going to go to the final demo that I'm going to show you here. And I'm not actually going to code anything because I do want to just show you exactly how it works. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show you in the emulator how this application works. So if you're familiar with the Contoso cookbook application on Windows 8, this should look very familiar to you. So just wait for it. So you can see there's regions. So say, for example, I want to look at Indian food. I can do that. There's just dummy data right there. There's some recipes associated with it, and I can click on that. So it's just a Contoso cookbook app. But say, for example, you wanted a, um, you know, a, 
a recipe of the day, for example, you can do that. Now, if I go to the actual operating system and I go to settings, you'll notice here that there's a lock screen uh, opportunity right here, which basically allows me to say, what do I want on my lock screen? Now, if I click on this, you'll notice, ah, I got photo, which is traditional thing of you know putting a photo in the background. You can get uh, Bing image of the day if you want, which is one of the other things, uh, as long, along with uh, other um, applications that you may have installed, such as Weatherflow. But in this case, you have Contoso Cookbook. So this is a good example of how you, know, you can add some functionality to your application that way. Now, the way it works is you have a situation where in the manifest file, which is associated with your project, you basically have to say, now let me, make, let me make this a little bit smaller for you to actually see. You have extensions. So as you can see here, you have extensions within your, uh, within your project, within the manifest file, which is used by um, uh, the Windows Store, phone store, to determine you know, what features are available on your application. You basically have to define saying that there's going to be notifications for icons, notifications for text fields in the background. So this is sort of the, the bottom thing that you have to do. So there's an ID associated with it and all those types of things. So nothing too, too wild there. But in the actual code here, so this is the detail page for a recipe, for example, um, you can actually add some capability here. So basically what you're saying is that if there's no you know, lock screen manager, await the lock screen manager and, and, and put it in. Or you know, if it's provided by the, uh, the current application, you can add the image if you wanted to and set the lock screen image to whatever image that you want. And that's basically it. I mean, there's a whole bunch of other things that you can do as well. But the whole idea here is that it's actually easy to push information to the lock screen. Mind you, of course, the user has to opt into it. So the user has to go to the settings tile on your secondary page and then go to the lock screen option in the settings and then pick your application. But this is a great way that you can actually add some really interesting information as well to your application and a more emotional connection to the user as well. All right. Maps have always been part of modern sm smartphone applications, not just Windows phones, obviously. But we have a new Maps control. So we do support the Bing Maps control from Windows Phone 7. It's still available, but it's actually been deprecated. So if you have an application that used Bing Maps before, it still works fine in Windows Phone 8. But we can't guarantee on major versions going forward that that will work. The reason why is you probably already know that we have a very strong partnership with Nokia. Um, and Nokia, in addition to building handsets, for example, is really, really good at uh, a number of other things as well, including maps. So Navtech is a company that Nokia bought a while back. And it's actually the back end for a number of different mapping uh, engines. And we are leveraging that information through, um, here, let me actually put this into screen mode like that. We are leveraging that information uh, for, through our partnership with Nokia so that you can actually get uh, mapping within your application. So as you can see here, you have road, aerial, hybrid, and terrain maps, which is actually something new to, uh, that, that we didn't have with Bing controls as well. So you have the ability to create amazing, amazing experiences, rich experiences, and accurate experiences as well. The no nav tech te technology that Nokia has is top notch, and it's a fantastic experience. It won't get you lost in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I dare you to try and that, uh, but you'll never get lost with, uh, with the, the Nokia Here Maps uh, technology. So keep that in mind if that's something you want. We also support speech. So speech has always been part of Windows phones through our uh, acquisition of Tell Me around four years ago. Um, Tell Me is integrated into Windows phones so that you can do a search, say, for example. Uh, all you have to do is press and hold the, uh, uh, the Start button. And when you do that, speech uh, modal box will come up and say, speak into the microphone and tell me what you want. So I could say Air Canada 194. And it'll tell me, oh, OK, well, Air Canada 194 departs from Toronto to Vancouver and uh, the time and whether it's delayed and things like that. So that's actually integrating um, tell me technology into Bing. So you can actually make use of and integrate tell me into your applications as well. So say, for example, it's a cookbook application. You could say, you know, search and then say, uh, I want to find out all the vegetable dish dishes within, uh, you know, within the application, within Contoso Cookbook. And then it'll provide you a listing of that if that's what you wanted to do. So think about that. It might be worth your while. 
Wallet is another one. So wallet uh, NFC capability as well, which we don't really get into very much, but the ability to integrate into the wallet feature. So it's not just about keeping uh, virtual money on your smart card chip or anything else like that. It's literally a way to actually keep track of all the things that you deal with, whether it's debit, debit and credit cards or loyalty and everything else like that. So as you can see here, there's an American Airlines example, Chase, uh, Groupon, and Fandango are the, some of the examples here. So it's not all monetary things. Some of it are, you know, for example, airline points and things like that. So if your application makes use of things that requires a loyalty program or something like that, it may be worthwhile actually integrating into the wallet because then your application not only lives on the start screen, it also lives on other places as well, which actually integrates it very nicely into the phone experience overall. So something to think, and think about. Camera and photos obviously have always been around on Windows Phone before. Uh, but we've actually added something called lenses. So if you have a great idea for providing a new type of lens, so like whether it's like a turbo camera idea where you're taking 60 sh uh, shots uh, in a second or something like that, uh, that would be considered a lens that you know a user could pick. So a user goes to the uh, to the camera application and then selects a lens that they want to use. In this case, for example, a turbo camera uh, lens, and then they can make use of that as in the context of photos. So. You have the ability to do that too. So if you have some really cool things, like uh, you know you wanted to do some image manipulation, whether that's in photos or videos, you can absolutely do that using the lens capability. So keep that in mind. And then in-app purchase, and this is where we're starting to get closer to the end of this session, but we do support in-app purchase within Windows Phone 8. It was not supported within Windows Phone 7, unfortunately. Um, the reason why this is important is it gives you more opportunities to monetize. And we'll get into monetization strategies in the final session of today. But basically, the whole idea here is that um, you, know, you have the ability to upsell. Um, so you may provide the application for free and then you know, have subscriptions to certain things. And it's actually very flexible. So you have the ability to say, OK, well, say, for example, you have you know, a game and you want to buy the user to buy gold to buy things. right? So you can charge for bags of gold, for example. Or you can have a situation where you have a magazine application and you're charging a subscription. So whether it's uh, you know one-time pur purchases or recurring payments and things like that, we all support that within the actual uh, Windows Phone store, and it's integrated into your application just fine. And the revenue model for splitting uh, for splitting revenues is the same as what you would on a paid application or game. It's 70% for you and 30% for us. So uh, that's how it works also on the in-app purchase. So keep that in mind. Now, there's two different ways to actually look at um, in-app purchase uh, for, for content. So there's durable. So as I said before, you, you, you buy once and you own forever. So game levels examples here that you have are, are a good example of that. Um, maybe it could also be a book, right? So that would be considered a durable. You buy the book online, say, for example, like the Amazon idea. It's your book regardless of device that you actually decide to look, on, uh, look at it on. And then there's things like consumables, whether that's you know bags of gold, as I said before, magazine subscriptions, things like that. Things that sort of you know lapse over time or are only usable in in a one case scenario or one time scenario. We do support all those types of things. So regardless of what you're thinking of doing with your in-app purchase capability, you have the ability to take care of that. So. That's basically it for the first session. Uh, the next session, we're going to actually skip a beat, and we're actually going to talk a little bit about HTML5, just straight HTML5, not in the context of phone specifically, because that will set us up very, very nicely for the third session of the day, where we talk about building native applications for Windows Phone. And then finally, we'll stop the day uh, with the final session of the day being uh, tips and tricks for succeeding on the Windows Phone store. So uh, hopefully you found this session uh, uh, interesting to yourselves and have some ideas as to how you can build for Windows Phone 8. Um, I know that was a whirlwind tour. If you have any questions, feel free to give me a shout. I'll just put my contact info there again. Uh, and we'll see you after the break as we go to the next session.